Um, first of all, let me thank you, uh, GRC and ICGB, for, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, ICGB is well known for its biosafety group and doing a lot of work internationally, so it's always a pleasure to be here and to be in such an, uh, a challenging and, and uh, rewarding environment. Yeah. Um, this is obviously a session in between. Yeah? I'm, I've left science a long time ago. I still need a scientific basis, but I left it a long time ago to move into the regulatory area. And I see it really as a change between all the previous presentations and what will come tomorrow, where we are looking at the landscape. Uh, I hope I can get this moving. Yes, uh, because now I'm with Perseus and we are providing services on biosafety and biotech regulation. I'll let you read it uh, probably in the handouts or whatever is available. Uh, but I'm here really to, to come with that kind of how do we bring these products to the market and what is important? Yeah, because we've heard about a lot of things that can be done. We will hear a little bit more. But I'm also looking ahead. And actually, to look ahead, I first want to look back a little bit. Because this is what we called new. At that moment, we called it plant breeding. But I think by now, we understand that they are not only necessary in plant breeding. We call these new techniques. And this is a short list that was presented in 2006. It was presented by the Dutch authorities to the European Commission and to their colleagues in all the countries in Europe to say like we urgently need to decide whether these are GMOs or not. We need to understand whether they are covered by regulation and whether these people need to follow everything that is needed to do a field trial, to bring it to the market as for a GMO. Well, the discussion hasn't finished yet. Now you tell me, if you're serious about innovation, if you're serious about stimulating research, how can you leave somebody waiting for 10 years to give an answer whether you're regulated or not? It makes a hell of a difference. <coughs> it makes a difference in the lab, in the field, and on the market. So I hope that we will keep that in mind when we have our discussions during the coming day. As you'll see, actually, at that moment, we were looking at zinc finger nuclease, because that was the technology at stake. It was gradually being expanded to first include meganucleases, and, and others, and of course, by now, also crispr cas is in the discussion. So clearly, if we continue to wait, the list will only grow longer. And of course, for this meeting, we will essentially look at all of the nucleases technologies, but remember that also the oligodirected mutagenesis is very similar. Yeah. It's not using nucleases, but it's also a mutagenesis technique. Some aspects of reverse breeding. Reverse breeding is about crossing out GM, actually have a knock-on effect on what we are discussing here about CRISPR-Cas. So clearly, those discussions need to happen. They need to be finalized, and the sooner and the clearer, the better. But let's focus, because indeed, what we are discussing here is a breakthrough. I think there's a general consideration, general agreement that with CRISPR-Cas and with the nucleases, we truly have a breakthrough. Not that that in itself is something really new, but finally, we are going to do things that we could not in the same way do before. I think that's really what the breakthrough is. And again, all of the science we've heard this afternoon just illustrates that. I think everybody is convinced that this is an incredible development, which will really give us a lot of opportunities. It's not only us. Obviously, the science is there. And already in 2011, the genome engineering was called the method of the year. OK, something has to be the method of the year, but nevertheless, that's a good thing. 2015, science calls CRISPR-Cas also the breakthrough of the year. So I think we're all in agreement that actually there's something happening here, and we all see this as very, very good in the scientific area. Not only science, but also business reacts. And of course, there's a business hype, because suddenly you get a lot of interest. Look at genome editing. Market worth 5.5 billion US dollars by 2021. Seven gene editing companies to watch. Yeah. A wave of potential. So clearly, both the science and the business is reacting to this breakthrough. However, that in itself will not be enough. It's only a tool. And I think that's where I want to put the R from the revolution between brackets to say, essentially, it will continue on an evolution that is already ongoing. Whether you're going to support the tool or not, 
that evolution is ongoing and it will just add to that evolution. It's up to us to see how we can do that. So what are we going to do with that tool? Well, we already heard science will quickly expand in this area. We will expand our knowledge very fast now. And I found these figures, I apologize if they're scientifically incorrect, but nevertheless, they give you an order of magnitude. With conventional tools, if we have to do those mice we were discussing, single mutations, sequential steps to get several mutations, then actually we end up with an incredible amount of money. And actually, the previous speaker could probably add to those budgets better than I do. But you end up with an incredible amount of money and an incredible amount of time. Whereas if you use the CRISPR system, we've already heard, we can do multiple mutations in one step. Yeah. It's very uh, easy to do that in a few weeks. And actually, as we've heard, also you can now order these kind of uh, sequences very quickly and at low cost. So obviously the promise is there. And obviously you understand why researchers are very excited. I was recently involved in reviewing some of the recent uh, European funded projects. And it will not be a surprise to you that actually in life science you can hardly open a project which does not have the name CRISPR-Cas in it. Yeah. It's that simple. Breeding. Well, breeding has evolved and, and actually breeding is a combination of selection, directing that selection, compatibility and variation. And for a long time we have been collectors. Yeah. Our, actually, our biggest part of history is that we collect things in nature. Man does the selection. We like things or we don't like them. They're sweet, they're bitter, we don't like them. They're actually toxic, we don't like them. But in essence, it was nature yeah, that decided the direction, that offered us several things. And that actually also decided on compatibility of species and decided on variation. Variation was not there. We had nothing to select from. Well, we have obviously evolved. And as we have more science, we're not only becoming a collector, but we're becoming a real selector. And man influences more and more the direction. Actually, all of our crops have been developed through man's interference. We've been trying to influence compatibility, things that normally could not cross with each other. We've tried to force them to cross. We've even made species yeah, by combining them. And we've been trying to influence variation. And actually, when we're talking about mutations, it uh, was already mentioned in plants, mutation breeding has actually been very popular and has resulted in quite a large number of varieties. With it. But clearly, there's an evolution. And as we learn more, and as we learn more about the genetics, we see that the influence of man becomes even more important. We could even think of man now becoming a designer. Yeah? We're not only looking at just what is there, but we're gradually moving to things that we would like to see. And I think that is the, the evolution that is ongoing. And again, today, we've heard a number of examples of that. I've taken this picture from a, uh, a report from the Royal Society of New Zealand, where they describe applications of genome editing <coughs> in agriculture. And obviously, they talk about plants, and they talk about all of the developments that are ongoing in the major crop plants. But they're also talking about cows without horns. I would avoid that you need to cut the horns to make sure that the animals don't uh, hurt themselves. There are other applications about pigs, for instance, which will grow smaller, maybe bigger muscles. Uh, there are indications about goats in China, which are being changed to have longer hair yeah, or more meat. So we see all of those things coming on. They're not science fiction. They're actually happening now. Uh, there's actually also one application in China which is about the pet pig, yeah, where actually uh, they really want to see these mini pigs that you could then have at home. thought they were already existing, but apparently you can even have them small. Another example I want to discuss with you is more in the industrial area. And the example I'm going to use is actually one not from genome editing, but from gene modification. It's a project we're involved in, which is dealing with chitosan. Now, chitosan typically is a, is a product that actually you will hardly see it. Yeah? You're going to phase it when you're maybe using a, a, a cream for uh, cosmetics or when you're having some bandage, or that's where chitosan is introduced. But it's a basic substance, and actually we're looking at some biotechnology development for a number of different reasons. 
And I'm using it as an example because I think this is the evolution we're going to see for all of these applications. You probably can also do it with uh, genome editing. So one of the first reasons could be that we're actually looking at new raw materials. Typically, chitosan, you, you collect it through, for instance, uh, shells from shrimps. That's where you have chitosan being extracted. Now, to do that, you obviously need a lot of shrimps and a lot of shells. You can only do it in places where you collect those. You have to do it in a place where uh, the wages are low yeah, and where uh, actually there's nothing else you can do with that waste. With the new raw materials, we're actually looking at, at some pulp or some, uh, in this case, corn. Yeah? We're looking at some, some sources of uh, sucrose. Um, the reason, one of the reasons for that is actually, although it sounds very good to be recycling waste, there's actually also other people that are looking for those shrimp shells. And that depending on the case, the price of those shells, even though that waste may go up and down, which makes it very unreliable for the producers of chitosan to know exactly how much will be available. So looking at new raw materials yeah, could be an application that we will see in the industrial use and where, again, genome editing will have a role. In this case, it's replacing shrimps, but it could also be, and actually this is the one where we see more excitement, it's where we can replace the old petroleum-based uh, products. Second part is about improved production systems. Yeah. If we can improve production systems by doing a modification in a fermentation or in just using another raw material, then clearly that will help us in saving energy, saving water, and so on. But you also could think about completely new production methods, replacing old ones. Again, when we're looking at the biotech production of chitosan, actually we're no longer looking at anything to do with the crustacean shells. We're now looking at fermenters, which would be better controlled and could produce a higher quality product. Funny also on the product side, we're going to see that through those improved production schemes, we can have improved products. Improved products could be in terms of purity, in terms of uh, identity, and so on. And finally, leading to really new products. And again, to give you the example, if chitosan, if you extract chitosan from the shrimp shells today, you will get a mixture of different kind of, of uh, molecules. They're all called chitosan. With the fermentation and with the modifications that we introduce, we can actually direct to specific molecules and those in a very enriched fraction, which means that now you get very specific characteristics of your product, which you would not be able to extract from that multitude of molecules before. So in a nutshell, I think what you're going to see with, a, um, with genome editing is essentially the same type of goals of research and applications. There's not going to be a revolution in what we do. In the product side, we're going to do the same thing. It's how we do it, what we do inside each of these boxes that will change and where we have an additional tool with genome editing, just like we had with gene modification. But of course, there is the acceptance part, and already we've been alluding to that. Specifically for this talk, I felt like I should know more about this. And to be fair, it's actually pretty poor. Even if you listen to all the previous speakers, we've all been saying the same thing. There are very few concerns, sorry to say so. Science gives us unequaled precision, new possibilities, speed and ease, and that's why we are excited. On the other side, we are discussing efficacy with the off-targets. Now, if that is the only major concern we have, I think we can deal with that. We're talking about safety. Anything else about safety than off-targets? I haven't heard anything new this afternoon that could not be related to that. I will talk a little bit about social and ethics because there's going to be much more tomorrow, as I understand it, in the program. But I want to address uh, those things briefly. About social, I think we need to realize, and again, this is a very privileged audience because you all knew why you were coming to this meeting. I hope so. Um, but outside, there's a public that actually tries to understand what's going on actually don't even try to. They don't want to be bothered usually, but nevertheless, occasionally, they are really interested and they have to. Now, 
if I don't know what it is, I go to Wikipedia. Yeah, I think everybody usually does occasionally. Well, this is a scientific audience, it's difficult to say that. <laughs> Anyhow, this is what you're going to find about genome editing. I invite you to read this. Are there people in the audience that are brave enough to say that they don't understand what it says? You're brave enough? Thank you. This is Wikipedia. This is the common man's source of information. And it talks about site-specific double-strand breaks. It talks about repair to non-homologous end joining. We've heard it this afternoon. Homologous recombination. Targeted mutations. Well, OK, that gives me another at least day of research to understand what it says. Yeah. Now, again, you are a privileged audience, and you've gone already through quite some presentations this afternoon. But read this one. Gene editing techniques are wholly different from mutagenesis. I understand that. It may not be true, but I understand it. They're in vitro modern biotechnology techniques. OK. It's produced by heritable material, blah, blah, blah. That's <laughs> yes, this is a source. Yeah, this is a source. I think this should be properly attributed. Um, again, it may not be completely true. And I would actually challenge quite a few of the, the statements that are in here. But it reads much better. Yeah? And at least I understand what they're trying to say. There's something going on with gene editing that is not the case with natural mutation. That's, I think, the basic message, which I don't necessarily subscribe to. <coughs> We're living in a society where, although there is excitement about technology, there are also some people who really are not believing science anymore. Yeah? Uh, this looks like an old scheme, but I think you're still going to find people who actually, they're not necessarily believing that the Earth is flat, but we have people who, who may not necessarily believe in evolution. So um, I think we have to take that into account that not everybody is sympathetic when we start to use our scientific language. We also see that there is corporate consolidation going on, and this is a concern that, that a lot of people share. Yeah? Now, there are different drivers for consolidation. One, indeed, is the fact that research, technology, development of products is actually costing much more. Regulatory costs are very high to develop a product. And on the other hand, we also see that the income, although still quite uh, substantial, is reduced or is threatened. But this is a part where people feel like there's something going on and I, don't, I lose control. It's now in the hands of a few big multinationals, and we don't want to see that. I would challenge that actually with genome editing and what we've heard this afternoon, actually you provide that power back. Yeah? You don't need all of those very sophisticated and very expensive uh, procedures to do it. I think actually genome editing could be a way to circumvent some of these costs. Again, we will have to discuss <coughs> how we see that, because if we are, again, building regulatory hurdles beyond practical approaches, and actually, we could quickly see this going up again. So we need to understand what direction we want to take. Workforce competencies. Actually, I think we used to say we were looking for the same picture. Yeah. So very good. Um, this is what people think about breeding. Yeah, breeding is in the field, and you have all of these less developed laborers yeah, that can actually have work and will be having a job there. And now we're moving to this one, yeah, where actually sophisticated people in labs yeah, are doing these very, very complicated scissors and uh, pasting work. Yeah. Now, there's a number of misleading things in this picture. First of all, you all know that it doesn't look like this. Yeah. DNA has nothing to do with blue pearls. Yeah. Uh, and there's actually no real scissors going on. But you already knew that one. The second thing that is misleading is that, obviously, these pictures are not replacing each other. We're not moving away from the field to do everything in the lab. We're doing things in the lab which eventually will end up in the field and eventually still will employ people like this guy. By the way, if you look carefully, you're going to see that on the guy's t-shirt, it says Monsanto. <laughs> it's actually a field trial from Monsanto 
where this guy is working to do the pollinations. So it's not necessarily replacing workforce. I think we're moving to a different situation. That evolution is ongoing. And we will see complementarity between all those functions. And again, it comes to my point to say, like, we're not looking at new products. It will still be corn. It will still be cows. It will still be pigs. But the technology to get there, that's where the major revolution is happening. So I quickly cover these, because I think we we're going to hear even more tomorrow. But obviously, we cannot leave them. We cannot just look only at the scientific excitement. And I think also the previous speakers have, have clearly indicated the balance between these different <coughs> things. So there is a balance. And also on the ethical side, there is a balance, because we can either express risk. And we can look at risk to say, like, risk has to do with how do we prove safety? How do we make sure everything is safe? Or we can look at it to say, we have to regulate this. This is the only way to ensure safety. We need to think about the balance between those two on that side. On this side, we're looking at benefits. And again, I think there's an entire different discussion. If you're looking at this person really is sick, will die, and it's the last chance, compared to this person really would like to have bigger muscles uh, without necessarily going to the gym. I think those would be very different things that we need to put in the balance. Most ethical concerns, as far as I could find them, relate to humans and germline uh, editing, where we have to be careful again. And again, I mean, again, in terms of we've seen how that has distracted the discussion with GMOs, is that we're not using a specific concern to look at the entire technology. If you are specifically concerned about germline editing, then you should not reflect that on genome editing as a whole. Then we should really discuss what we're talking about. We should really focus on the specific cases. It's a well done strategy to make issues as broad as possible. But the discussion about germline editing is very different when we're talking about plants than if we're talking about man. This is the issue. Yeah. A young person knows that they actually have this disease, that they carry this disease, and we can cure that disease with this therapy, with the gene therapy. So the question could be, should we do it, or should we just let them die? Ethical question. Well, let's say that that person decides, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it in a way that actually also all of my progeny, and the progeny of my progeny, will be cured. It's one option. The concern we have, of course, or the concern that's being raised, is the fact that what if, in next generations, we see side effects popping up? What if the consequence of your action actually is something more negative at the end of the day? And we only see it in two, three, four generations. Those people, those next generation babies, did not have a choice. You decided for them. Are you allowed to do that? I think that's a typical ethical debate, and we should we, we probably are going to discuss that more either tonight over, over wine or tomorrow morning. Some people say that this is enough reason to call for a precautionary approach, to say, because you don't know, you shouldn't even do it now. And again, I think this is a way to look at the precautionary approach that we need to, to discuss whether that's true or not. But this discussion is very different if we're talking about animals. This discussion is very different if we're talking about crop plants. And we should make sure that we understand really what is at stake and what the issues are and how relevant they are for the cases that we are discussing. Those crop plants today, we also don't give them the freedom of choice to mate and to make progeny as they want. So let's be careful about how we interpret those things. Which comes back indeed to the question, do we actually have a good idea of what the right choice is? Yeah. Our cloning of human embryo has made clear once again how science has outpaced bioethics. Some critics think our work is tantamount to playing God. That's so unfair. I'm not playing. <laughs> so I think this is the question. Do we really know what is appropriate yeah. for our planet, for the species that are around, 
And when you were mentioning gene drive, and do we have the right to wipe out an entire population or an entire species? I think that would be the kind of questions that you would obviously want to address in this respect. So to summarize, I have rushed you, and trying to keep up a little bit with time, uh, I rushed you to a number of these points. Yeah, we've seen that it's, well, I, I hope I made a point to say like this is, although it's a technological revolution and we all see the breakthrough, what we're going to see in society is more an evolution that is already going. Even if you decide today that we should ban genome editing, that evolution is ongoing. We cannot stop our scientific knowledge and we cannot stop our understanding of how things work. Uh, we definitely need to, uh, to look at ethical issues and to look at the, the social aspects, which actually question us to maybe reconsider or consider some of our essential values yeah, that we find important to share. Or to put it in a different way, it's only a tool of which society will in most cases not even see that we are applying it because it's all happening behind the scenes in production processes, in breeding programs, and so on. You will not see it when you buy your steak in the supermarket. But yet, society will face the issues and the debate, and we need to make sure that we bridge that in a very elegant way. Thank you very much.